So I want to introduce Avi. Uh, Avi is going to speak concerning several things of our interest, things that interest us. And uh, just come on up and speak. Okay, I thank uh, Pastor Diaz for giving me uh, three hours to speak. <laughs> Don't worry, time goes by very quickly. When the lights are blinking and there's nobody left in the room, I stop. So uh, very, very happy to be here again since 1994. And um, I'll say very quickly, is, was there anyone here in 1994? I don't know, do any of you remember me now? Okay, and you, I mean, you can't forget me even if you want to. And uh, what happened was, uh, I, well, amongst all my other sins, uh, I was a, an Israeli army spokesman. And we were taught in the Israeli Army uh, Spokesman's Office, firstly, in the Middle East, you learn to expect the unexpected. Banta. Huh? Banta. 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 Is that You know, I didn't even know that word. Th th I'm, I'm spending too much time here with the Christians, that's why. <laughs> and uh, the second thing we were taught is that uh, in 1994, which is after Desert Storm, and Israel was hit with 39 rockets. So there was this big debate. Should Israel switch over to an anti-rocket system or should we continue holding on to the territory? So the Likud, of course, said hold on to the territories. And Yitzhak Rabin, who was our prime minister then, uh, said, well, we have to take into account new missiles coming in and don't respect borders. So I said that here. <laughs> Pastor Garrison wouldn't have me anymore here. So, so this is actually, for me, a resurrection <laughs> that I'm back here again. And I love Pastor Garrison and John Klein, and I, I miss them. Maybe one day we'll have a chat, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so yes, I was an Israeli Army spokesman in the reserves for 14 years. And uh, before that, I lifted shells and cleaned uh, howitzers uh, for 16 years in Israeli artillery reserves. Uh, I've been living in Israel 53 years. Uh, my parents were from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Uh, I was born in New York, but I spoke Spanish in, uh, in my house before I spoke English. And um, so I'm an American who speaks Spanish. Uh, I moved to Israel, I speak Hebrew. My wife is Egyptian, Sephardic, so I speak Arabic. And of course, amongst my other sins, I studied Russian and, and Greek. So I'm very busy, I'm very much a linguist, and I love history. And so the first thing I want to say before I start you know, with my message is that when you're a historian, you don't really take sides. What you have to do is understand the history from both sides. And uh, this isn't one of my faults, because I'm not one of those people who totally uh, throws myself into one camp and everyone else is bad. I said, no, everyone is good. But there are differences, and each difference has to be studied. Now, um, I have to tell you a little bit about my family. Um, I was born and raised in New York, and my parents lived in Catholic Argentina. And there was never any anti-Semitism in Argent Argentina. My father was a young kid. He didn't even know he was Jewish, really, until later. And uh, my mom also went to a Catholic convent to study because there was no state school, so she had to go to a Catholic convent out there in the country in Argentina. And uh, they never experienced anti-Semitism. The purpose of the meeting is anti-Semitism. Came to America, and America uh, blessed us economically in a very nice way, and my parents decided that I should go to Hebrew school, uh, something they could not have in Argentina, out in the country where they live. And uh, I go to Hebrew school. I was born in 1949. So in 1955, when I was six years old, I started going to Hebrew school and to synagogue. And uh, at first, I didn't really like it because it was an entirely strange language. You know, Hebrew, different alphabet, different words. And my parents could not help me <laughs> with the homework. Uh, and until I was 13, I really didn't understand what was going on. But one thing uh, was made very clear to us, that all Christians are bad. Uh, now, don't forget, we had the Holocaust with the Nazis. We had the persecution of the Russians, czarists, and communists. We had the persecution of the Catholic Church in Spain, Portugal. And um, so my parents never taught me to hate Christians. But Hebrew school, they taught me all Christians are bad. And guess what? There will be a Holocaust in the United States one day. 
the Jews will die in America. And uh, I was 15 at that time. I corresponded with David Ben-Gurion. And I have two letters from the first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. And he said, all Jews must go home to Israel. So I was 15. I decided I'm moving to Israel. <laughs> Everyone thought I was crazy. Even today, people think I'm crazy. When I was 19, I moved to Israel by myself as a student. And I was very happy to get away from Christian America because all Christians are bad. That's what I was taught. Then I met my wife, Rachel, and that's a real story. And the first thing she says to me, she says, are you crazy? <laughs> my first meeting with my wife on a bus. We started talking just like, in Israel, you talk to everybody on the bus. Here it's harassment. <laughs> and you're crazy. Why did you leave America? America is the greatest country on earth. I said, because the Gentiles hate us. The Goyim. Now, are there any Gentiles here? If there are any Gentiles here, raise your hand. I, I like this church. Because I've been in a thousand churches. And almost all of them, the pastor says, we welcome our Jewish brother Avi and we Gentiles. So my wife says to me, are you saying that the Christians are Gentiles? And I said, yes, in America in 1968, you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. You're a Jew or you're a Christian. So my wife said to me, not only are you crazy, you're also ignorant. This is our first meeting. And by the way, 50 years of marriage, every discussion with my wife starts with, you're crazy, you don't know anything. <laughs> and she explains to me like this. She says, Jews and Christians believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Jews and Christians believe in the Torah. Yeah. And Jews and Christians believe that the Messiah is a Jew from Israel who speaks Hebrew. Yeah. Okay, so for the Christians, that's Jesus Christ. And for the Jews, the Jews don't know. Okay, so well, that's for later, okay? <laughs> so she said to me, the word Gentile means pagans. Anyone who was not at Mount Sinai, anyone who did not receive the revelation of God. Now, Christians might not have been originally at Mount Sinai, but if you're connected through Jesus, then you have the revelation. Okay. So out of 7 billion people on the face of the earth, 2 billion are Christian, or shall I be politically correct to say Judeo-Christian. 5 billion people, wonderful people. You have, have 1.5 no, 1, 1 billion Muslims, 1, 1. 5, well, it's actually 1.5 billion Hindus, 1.5 billion Chinese and uh, Buddhists. They're great people, but they don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they're good people. But they are the Goyim. They are the Gentiles. And that went totally against everything I was taught in Hebrew school. She said, the Jews and the Christians, does anyone here know Arabic? In Arabic, there's a saying, Ahel el Kitab. Ahel el Kitab is people of the book. The Jews and the Christians are the people, singular, of the book. And the only difference between Jews and Christians is that the Jews keep the Sabbath on Saturday and the Christians keep the Sabbath on Sunday. Therefore, the Muslims in Egypt, where my wife grew up, said, if the Jews keep the Sabbath on Saturday, slit their throats on Saturday, and if the Christians keep the Sabbath on Sunday, slit their throats on Sunday. And if you ask any Christian or any Jew who lived in the Middle East, they say, yeah. It's common knowledge that in Islam, they're going to kill the Jews and the Christians. So I want to start with a teaching from the Hadith. Hadith, all these things are important. Because if in Afghanistan, they announced yesterday, today Kabul, tomorrow Washington, they're coming for you. And you've got to know who they are. And Muslims are great people. But the Islamic system is like Nazism in Germany. Germans are good people. But Nazis are not. Russians, Chinese, Cambodians, good people. But communists are not. Japanese are good people, but Tojo fascists, are, I mean, if you know the history, you know that people are good by nature, but the man-made ideologies are evil. And that applies to Islam. So the Jews and the Christians are the al al-Kitab, people of the book, and the Muslims are good people. But the Muslims, listen carefully, have another god. The god of Islam is the moon god, the war god, and the sword god. And the god of Islam is called Allah. Allah means God. Allah alilahi means Allah, the moon crescent God. You ever notice the moon crescent is their symbol? Now what does it say in Deuteronomy 17? Deuteronomy 17 says, 
if anyone in the gates of Israel prostrates to, worships and serves the moon, the sun, and the stars, take them to the gates of the city and stone them. In other words, it's a capital offense to be a Muslim if you're following the Bible. Now, I live in the state of Israel. I live in the Jewish state. If I get up on Israeli radio and TV and say that the Muslims should be stoned, I'm going to be put in jail or an insane asylum. But that's what the Bible says. Islam is a capital offense. Can I say that in just any church? Okay, now I want to get back to the Hadith. In Islam, you have two primary teachings. You have the Quran and you have the Hadith. Quran is their Bible. Does, does anyone here know that the Quran was written by a rabbi and a priest? It's in the black book on my back table. I, I studied all of Genesis, Chuck Missler style, and I, I show it very clearly. All the things that are hateful in the eyes of God are those things that Islam has adopted. Killing and raping and stealing and lying. It's, it's, it's there in the Quran. It says do it. Okay? But Hadith is a collection of teachings uh, reputedly going back to Muhammad's time. I'm going to give you two before we get into the message. You know, they say the rabbi before he speaks says, before I speak, I'd like to say a few words. <laughs> so I'm saying a few words right now. There's a teaching in the Hadith that on the Day of Judgment, there will be a final battle with the Jews. And the Muslims will kill every Jew on the face of the earth. Now, am I making this up? Ask any Muslim. This is at the heart of Islam. There is no Muslim who will deny that all the Jews have to die. Okay. There will be some Jews who hide behind rocks and trees and to escape the Muslim pursuers. And on that day, Allah, the God of Islam, will call out to the rocks and the trees, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. In other words, Allah hates us. All the Jews must die. So I have to tell you a little story. I'm a very unique man. You know why I'm a unique man? Because I have a unique wife. Many people say I'm a prophet. I say I'm not a prophet, I just listen to my wife. <laughs> and in my first book on the table, I talk about 9-11, four years before it happened. Was I a prophet? No. My wife watched the TV in Arabic, and they said, we're going to bring those suckers down. We're going to destroy the World Trade Center. They tried in 1993, and they failed. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So she saw the news announcer. Behind him, there was one of these long calendars with the two towers on fire. This is five years before 9-11. And when I wrote it in my book, everyone attacked me. Oh, that's hate speech. And I appreciate Pastor Diaz for having me, and of course, Laurie and Stan for inviting me here. Because it's not every day that a church brings a convicted criminal to speak. <laughs> How many people know I have a three year jail sentence in Switzerland? Because I said that Allah, the God of Islam, is not God, but is Satan. And Islam is not a religion, but a criminal psychosis. I mean, you tell me, look what's going on in, in, with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Isn't that a criminal psychosis? Amen. Locking up women in the house, isn't that a criminal psychosis? Okay. So Rachel goes to fill up the car with gas. We live in Jerusalem, near Jerusalem. And for about 30, 40 years, we've been filling up with gas in French Hill. Does anyone know French Hill in Jerusalem? French Hill, nice Jewish neighborhood, bordering with an Arab town of Isawiya. Good people. The gas station is owned by a Jew, but the gas station attendants are Arabs from Isawiya. We, we live very well with them. And my wife comes to the gas station. I'm not around. I'm here preaching. <laughs> so my wife goes to the gas station. My wife used to be a TV announcer on Israeli TV in Arabic. My wife was a very, she still is a beautiful woman, but we're both 72, 73, so it's not exactly the way it was then. But So Rachel would come to the gas station and give them the keys. They'd fill the car up with gas. They'd check the oil, check the water. They would wash the car, and then give her the keys. I mean, she'd pay and everything. But they adored Rachel. My wife was a TV superstar. And one day, they said to her, you know, Rachel, you know we love you. Yeah, I know. And uh, 
but we don't want anything bad to happen to you. She said, what do you mean? Well, you know, Allah is going to mouth the rocks and trees, and they're going to call on us to come on and kill you. And we don't want to kill you. We love you. You know we love you. So please, Rachel, please convert to Islam. Otherwise we, otherwise, we will kill you. My wife is from Egypt. She understands how these people think. I've been living with a woman. If I want to stay alive, I better listen good to what she said. This comes from the Hadith, that all the Jews must die. You ask any Muslim, do the Jews all die? Yes. So many Christians will say, <laughs> so what do we care about the Jews? OK, wait a second, I'm not finished. There's another Hadith. How many people know that Jesus Christ is a Muslim? You don't know that Jesus Christ is a Muslim? Ask any Muslim. They will tell you. It's at the heart of their faith. Jesus Christ comes back a second time as an Arabic-speaking Muslim dressed in black on a black horse, and he has a lance, and he runs it through the Antichrist. He kills the Antichrist, who's a Jew. How many people know the Antichrist is a Jew? Ask any Muslim. If you ask any Muslim, they will say, wow, you're so smart. How did you know that? That's our secret. The Muslims say, that's our secret. How did you know that? They will say, well, Avi Lipkin was in town, but uh, tomorrow night he's going to be in Melbourne. And then uh, on uh, Thursday, he's flying to Atlanta, then flying back Friday. Then he goes back to, uh, to uh, Tampa. Then he goes back to Fort Walton Beach. Then he goes up to uh, Alabama. I'm going to be in uh, Montgomery. And then I'm going to be in Vicksburg. Mississippi, and then back to Dallas. I just came from Dallas driving. I have a crazy life. I wake up at night, I walk into the wall thinking that that's where the bathroom was from the hotel two nights ago. I wake up, I'm, dream I'm dreaming about where I was two, three nights ago. I'm totally disoriented. But one thing I'm oriented is that Islam has plans. Now, Jesus Christ is coming back as an Arabic-speaking warrior. He kills the Antichrist, who's a Jew. Then he goes up to Jerusalem, prays on the Temple Mount with his fellow uh, Muslims. Then they come down, they break all the crosses, they destroy all the churches of the Christians, they destroy all the synagogues of the Jews, and on that day of judgment, all the Jews and all the Christians who are considered one people, Ahel al-Kitab, people of the book, all the Jews and Christians will have their throats personally slit by Jesus Christ the Muslim. Do you believe me or not? I'm not making this up. This is the Hadith. Ask any Muslim. You know, for the first 17 years of the 31 years that I've been in churches, I went by the name Victor Mordecai. <laughs> because it's, that's my Hebrew name. It's not in any phone book. Because I was afraid to be killed. I'm 31 years preaching the message. And uh, I remember my father and brother, rest in peace, lived in Great Neck, New York. And everyone said, don't say Great Neck, don't say Great Neck. The Muslims will come to Great Neck and they're going to kill your father and your brother and blow up the house. So my father and brother died of natural causes. They sold the house. So I keep saying Great Neck, Great Neck. Let the Muslims go to Great Neck because I'm not there anymore. Anyway, so you understand that the Jews and the Christians are doomed. And when the Taliban say, today, Kabul, tomorrow, America, we've got a problem. And I want you to know, Trump is just as guilty as Biden. Now, I'm not saying American boys and girls should be killed in Afghanistan, but if you don't defend life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness there, you're going to be defending it here. How many people know that there are 30 million Muslims in America today? And they, they came into this country through bribery of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the people guarding the, the defense of this country. Republicans, Democrats, same crap. All bribed by Islam. It's in my books. They come to the universities and say, here's $23 million. No strings attached. Really, no strings attached. So they get the attention of the university. And then they say, here, we have another $23 million if you open up an Arabic language and Islamic uh, religion uh, chair. The university is not going to say no. 46 million bucks is a lot of money. Then we're going to give you 500 young male Muslim students every year. They will pay full room board and tuition. And now that's a lot of money for any university town. After two years, you have 500 freshmen, 500 sophomores. It's 1,000. After three years, you have 
500 juniors, 500 sophomores, 500 freshmen. And then by the fourth year, you've got 2,000 Muslim boys there, and boys will be boys. And they are allowed to marry non-Muslim women, American women. After two years, passport. You marry an American girl, after two years automatically you get a passport. You get a passport, then you can bring in all your relatives from the Middle East. That's called chain immigration, and President Trump was talking about that. And I have to tell you something. What happened to me in Switzerland could happen here in America too, where they'll say to me, well, you can't talk uh, hate speech against Islam. So I'm not against Muslims as people. Muslims against, as people are good people, but Islam is a system worse than Nazism. One of the things I admire about Lori and Stan is that, and I've been following also their activities decades, is that the boards of education in this country are bribed. Universities are bribed to be pro-Islamic, to be pro-Arab. And the Christians are snoring. Christians are asleep. By the way, the Jews are not asleep. The Jews are comatose. <laughs> Do you know that there's no synagogue that will invite me to speak? Nobody wants to hear this stuff. So I don't want to talk bad about my own fellow people, but I'll tell you something. I love my son Aaron. My son Aaron, has anyone heard about my son and his teachings? Okay, I'm here to talk really about my son. So this is the, the real purpose of my being here, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what my son does. Aaron has a tour company. It's called Lipkin Tours. And those who came with Mickey Barnett there probably came with Lipkin Tours. Were you on with Lipkin Tours or just Mickey Barnett or as a guy? Guy, okay. And uh, what happened was he worked with Jewish tourism, primarily birthright. Has anyone heard of birthright? Which is to bring Jewish kids to Israel. And uh, at a certain stage, after like 15 years, he decided he was not happy with that. And he said to me, Daddy, you've been in hundreds of churches, thousand churches, maybe we can bring Christian tours to Israel. And that's what we did. Then my son started getting really interested, you know, because life is a process. You don't go to college or high school and say, okay, now I know everything. I'm 72, 73, I'm still learning every day stuff I can't believe I didn't know. So my son starts studying archeology. span And on the back table, there are three books by Professor Adam Zartal. Did anyone hear about Adam Zartal? Okay, well, I see one hand. This is so important why I'm here tonight. And uh, my son goes to one of his lectures and falls off his chair. Adam Zartal, rest in peace, died just a few, like a year or two ago. He was a kibbutznik. He was a socialist. He was not a religious Jew. In the 1973 Yom Kippur War, he got blown up with shrapnel, you know, from an Egyptian uh, rocket. And uh, he almost died. He was in the hospital, went through rehab. And nobody believed he would ever be on his feet again. But he eventually got on his feet with the use of crutches. And uh, he decided, that the kibbutz said, well, you can't really do anything in the kibbutz anymore. Is there something you really want to do? He said, yes, I want to study archaeology. So Adam Zartal started studying archaeology, became a doctor in archaeology. And he developed uh, a system, which actually he was taught in the School of Archaeology, that you take a certain area, a certain acreage, and you get like 10 men and women walking shoulder to shoulder, and they're looking all the time at the ground. And they're looking especially for pottery. Because pottery, you send for carbon dating, and then you know from what period it was. So you've got uh, Arabic pottery, you've got Byzantine pottery, you've got Persian pottery, and you've got Israelite pottery. And um, he did his work in a place where nobody had done the work before, which was Samaria. Samaria and coming across the Jordan River north of the city of Jericho. You all heard of the Battle of Jericho. The crossover from Jordan of today to Israel was at the Valley of Yabok. Valley of Yabok. It's where Abraham crossed over. It's where Jacob crossed over. Um, and they find all this pottery. 
and uh, all of a sudden they find strange footprints. Did anyone hear about the footprints? Huh? Yeah, I'm going to talk about this. Now, I have to tell you something. Is there anyone here who knows Hebrew? You know? Are you Jewish? Sephardi. Good. So, you know Hebrew, what is Aliyah la Regel? Aliyah la Regel. Aliyah la Regel are Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. It, Aliyah la Regel means pilgrimage. But literally, Aliyah la Regel means going up to the foot. And uh, they find this tremendous, the DVDs on the table, it's called the Footprints of God. Oh, I see somebody has done their homework here. And this is the size of three football fields. Yeah? Oh, so you know already. I feel silly. This is a postgraduate course. Uh, yes, and so they found like seven of these footprints crossing over the Jordan River into the what they call the Desert of Samaria and then going up through the Tirza Valley all the way to Nablus, all the way to Shechem, Shechem. And uh, so, you know, Adam Zartal is walking with his people and they're looking for pottery and they find so much pottery. And then they find a mound, a mound of rocks. And it, it didn't make any sense. Why would there be a mound of rocks there? Are you, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going home. <laughs> Goodbye. I'm going to have to tell my son that you set up a trap for me here today. <laughs> and they didn't know what the mound of rocks was. So they started pulling away the rocks. And lo and behold, after they remove all the rocks, they, and they didn't even know what they had found because they were not religious Jews. But religious Jews saw that what they saw is that this is exactly the altar in Jerusalem. At the first temple, second temple. And they find there, see, there's a foot, like it's a footprint. The city of David is a footprint also. It's like in the, resembling a foot. The foot meant wherever your feet will tread, I will give to you. It was like a flag. God's presence is stamped into the ground. That's what the big footprint meant. I mean, and the Jews go around in circles like the Muslims go around the black stone on the Hajj. We go around the, these uh, footprints. And uh, I have to tell you something. They found the altar of Joshua. And uh, you know what's happening now? There's a big battle that reaches the prime minister's office. The, the Muslims bring in the tractors to bulldoze it. What did we see in Afghanistan? Do you remember the big statues of Buddha in Bamiyan? They got blown up by the Taliban. The Islamic way of thinking is you erase anything which is pre-Islamic. If it's Jewish, if it's Christian, if it's Buddhist, if it's Hindu. Because Allah reigns supreme and Allah destroys all the other civilizations, all the other religions. And I'm telling you, not that they're coming here, they're here already. And they are biding their time to go into action. You know, one of my messages this evening, in about three hours from now, actually, no, two hours now, I'm going to talk. <laughs> oh, okay. The worst thing is to say, and in conclusion, and then goes on another hour. Yeah. I do that too. The Jews are going to be going home soon to Israel. I don't know if you know that or not. There are four, it's not going to be a happy circumstance because the Jews, the Jews will never leave America unless God sets up something that's going to make them leave. The hunters. You've got the Muslims, you've got the neo-Nazis, you've got the Antifa, and you've got the Black Lives Matter. The one thing they all have in common, kill the Jews. And they won't let me speak in the synagogues. And the Jews don't believe in owning guns. And they're the ones who are going to get it. And I'm going to be prime minister. You know why? Because our population is 7 million Jews, half a million Christians. When 10 million American Jews and Christians move to Israel, it's going to be 17 and a half million. My party will be the majority party in the Knesset. <laughs> I'll be prime minister if my wife doesn't kill me. <laughs> she might kill me. I don't know. She's, I'm married to a tough bird, let me tell you. You know, I'm here in the States. It's terrible. Nobody yelling at me. 
Nobody telling me this is wrong, this is wrong. You know, behind every successful man stands this little woman reminding him just how unsuccessful he is. <laughs> so I say to my wife, I'm in the church, I say, you know what? You get up and speak. I'm going to sit down. She gets up to speak. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me anymore. You know, in Israel, when she was the TV announcer, I was the husband of. I was a very famous man in Israel. I was the husband of. Now I'm the father of Aaron. Because Aaron is going around teaching these things. Okay. I want to go into something else now. Regarding the archaeology, I, I feel very much in a unique situation. Like I said, I was born in 1949. And at age six, I was already a fanatic stamp collector. I love stamps, coins from all over the world. And today in Israel, I think in America also, when you tell children it's important to collect stamps and coins, they say you're a dinosaur. Because who uses stamps today? Everyone, you know, two, 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 two with the computer, and then they, they get these stickers in the post office. Nobody collects stamps anymore. I said, no, but the stamps teach you the whole history of the world, of all the nations. No, you're a dinosaur. It doesn't interest us. My grandkids. 1962, I was 13. I was going to have my bar mitzvah. I was preparing in Hebrew school for the bar mitzvah. And I was a very ornery kid. I was trading stamps under the table with a buddy of mine while the teacher was teaching Hebrew. Because I didn't care about the Hebrew lessons. I wanted to trade stamps. And the teacher comes over and says, let me see the stamps. And one of the stamps was from the United States Post Office, April 1962, the centenary, the 100 years of the Battle of Shiloh, Tennessee. That's for you, Shiloh, Tennessee. Battle of Shiloh. And uh, so the teacher, instead of rebuking me, said, do you all know that there is a Shiloh in Israel? And we were 13-year-olds. Who knew what Shiloh was? So he said, where is it? She said, we don't know. It's under the ground. Because we hadn't, it was in Jordan, actually. We didn't discover it. And I want to tell you something. One of the problems with our leadership in Israel, and perhaps our leadership here in America, is that if you don't find something, it didn't exist. No, it didn't exist, but you didn't find it yet. So after the 67 war, the Israelis sent in teams to look for the biblical sites that nobody knew where they were. And that includes the, the, uh, the footprints and, the, and, and Joshua's altar. Nobody knew where Shiloh was. And so one day, the Arab Christians who lived in an Arab Christian village by the name of Hirbet Sila. Hirbet Sila means the ruins of Shiloh. In other words, you go to the Arabic, they maintain the name, the biblical name, because the Christian Arabs are loyal to the Torah also. Huh? Oh, I'm getting out of here. No, but I'm gonna, I have a reason to tell you these things. I'm going to give it to him when I see him. Let me tell you. And... Uh, And uh, so the Christians in Hirbet Sila said, it's down, Shiloh is down in the village, down, down in the valley. So the Israelis bring in the archaeologists, and they start digging, and they find four Greek Orthodox churches. They don't know. Let me talk to them. <laughs> I mean, you can pick on me, but I'll pick on you right back. In Spanish, they say, porque te quiero te aporreo because I love you, I chastise you. So anyway, so, so they dig down six feet in front of one of the churches, and they find a mosaic. You all know what a mosaic is. It's one of those beautiful Greek, uh, it's like a plaque with letters and words and made out of stones. Y yes, and uh, so the, the mosaic said in Greek, may the Lord Jesus have mercy on the people of Shiloh. So bingo, we found Shiloh because of Mr. Jesus of Nazareth. So why am I telling you about the stamp collection? Because a little kid doesn't know anything in America, goes to Hebrew school, the teacher doesn't know anything, and then when they are out in the field in the archaeology, all of a sudden they discover the real thing. And my son and Mickey, all these people have been taking me to all these places. 
It's so emotional. And I have news for you. Every day, every day, there are things that actually might have been discovered a year or two ago, and they're being categorized you know, by the scientists and uh, daytime. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on in there from 3,200 years ago. It's our history. Now, why am I talking about these things? Because these things validate the Torah. The Torah is the truth. It is not a storybook. It is the real history. Now, what's our problem? Our problem is that because all these discoveries came after 1967, the people who ruled Israel from the very beginning, the socialists, they said there's no God. Yitzchak Rabin even said that the Torah is a, a book of mythology and fables. My son, Aaron, went to school in Ramat Eshkol, and the teacher said the Bible is a malarkey. It's just a mythology. And my, my son, even in high school, believed in God. So my first message about Islam is that you have an enemy that wants to destroy you because their God is Satan. But there's another enemy who's even more dangerous than the Muslims, because the Muslims are all crazy. These people have to be re-educated. Chinese are right, they have to have re-education in the camps. Um, the problem is the atheists, the apostates, and the New Agers who rule in Israel, the United States, and the whole world. These are the people who suppress Christianity, they suppress Judaism, they suppress God. And I think God is going to act in a very m major way very soon. But what my son is doing, you know, I take my kippah off to him, take my hat off to him, because my son is really facing a much greater enemy, the atheists who don't believe in God, whether they're Jew, Christian, whatever. Everyone has to believe in God. I don't know if you go to church, you go to synagogue, we have a prayer in Hebrew, aleinu, aleinu shabach. So there's a part there where it says, every knee will bend and every tongue will swear loyalty. And in that day, everyone know that God is one. Jews say it, Christians say it in the Christian prayers. You know, we have so much in common, Jews and Christians, but the devil wants to divide us. So I'm very excited that I do what I do, and I'm even more excited that Aaron, my dear son, is doing the work that he's doing. And he's just very, very depressed because of the COVID that there are no, no tours coming. So we're waiting for the tours to start up again and take them to the places. There are things that uh, I will say it in a way which you cannot really pinpoint it anywhere, but we believe that we have found beams of wood from the first and second temple periods. We are sending them for carbon dating. Can you imagine finding beams going back 2,000 years and 3,000 years? I, I can't say. Uh, no, it, it, it's under wraps at this time. Huh? What? Uh, they're, they're in safekeeping. But it's also a very convoluted story how we got them. But, uh, and Islam comes and says, destroy everything. You tell me that's not the devil. It is the devil. And this is important for every Jew and for every Christian. Because proving the validity of the Torah for the Jew and the Christian is of utmost importance. So I love Mickey, even though he ruined my, my message tonight. I, I think you had me come and speak so you could let me have it. It's OK. I enjoy it. Yeah, no, no. Mickey is like my right hand in the party. OK. By the way, we have a, uh, my, my, like my number two is a messianic leader in Israel by the name of David Friedman. I don't know if anyone knows him. Does anyone know him? But he asked, sent me an email today asking for prayer because he's in the ICU with COVID. And he's my number two. I said to him, if you die, I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. <laughs> and then I said to him, don't worry, only good people die young. <clears throat> so anyway, so I'm hoping he'll be, he'll be okay. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the political situation in Israel. It may be some of you might be asking, you know, like, what happened to Netanyahu? 
Does anyone wonder what happened to Netanyahu? I mean, if you don't wonder, I won't talk about it, but if you want to know what happened, I'll tell you. And you know, I have to tell you, the stuff I'm sharing with you tonight is very much personal experiences. This is not textbook. I moved to Israel when I was 19. And I was wearing a very dark blue shirt and dark, a light blue tie and a, like an Air Force type cap, blue. And uh, I had epaulets, and braids and everything. I got off the plane and uh, the socialist bureaucrats looked at me when I got off the plane and said, you are a marked man. You will never have a job in Israel. And uh, so I went to university, got arrested many times, demonstrations and things like that, you know, for Iraqi Jewry and against France for the blockade in 1969-70. And um, I, I was like, um, they say in French, enfant terrible. I was like the bad boy, really bad boy. Then I got elected as head of the Likud students in Hebrew University in 1970. And then everything stopped because I finished my BA, I went to the army, then I got married. Then I went into business, because everyone said, you're never gonna get a job, so I went into business. If you go into business, it's nobody's business what you're doing. And then after 10 years, I, my business failed, and actually I was very happy when my business failed. I lost my house, I lost everything, but I was very happy because I didn't wanna do the business. I, I got kinda like pushed into the business that I didn't wanna do. We were, we were, my wife and I were exclusive importers of Teledyne water pick in Israel. You know water pick for the teeth and gums? And, um, but I didn't think it, God made me move to Israel to be an importer of Teledyne water pick. I didn't know what I, God wanted, but what happened eventually was I became a preacher, which is what I've been doing 31 years now. And believe me, if I weren't preaching, I'd be a bum. Actually, I'm retired, but people like me never retire. So, in 1988, we had the elections in which the Likud won under Yitzhak Shamir. And uh, I was uh, the editor and translator of the Likud campaign plank. By the way, Mickey was working with me in the Likud at that time also. We were also having lunch every day together. Mickey, Barnett, and I were roommates two years in the university. And then he met my wife when I met her. And I had a problem. I would study until 2, 3 in the morning, and then I'd get up late. My, my wife was up every morning, always has been up every morning at 5 in the morning. And so she knock on the door, Mickey was already up. He's, Mickey's an officer, you know, a gallant officer, and he's up early also, and I'm snoring, and, uh, and so they, they wink at each other, they pick up my army frame uh, uh, bed and turn it over. They say, Avi, get up, Avi, get up. Third time, Avi, get up, they, they, they would overturn the bed. We had a great time in college. And uh, actually, one more little story. I shouldn't be telling this, it has nothing to do with the message. I went to Turkey to Istanbul, and I bought one of these pipes, that long. And I'd be reading the book and be puffing away on my pipe, then my wife, I just met her. I just met her. She knocks on the door, and I say, come in. <laughs> so she comes into the room, and the room is full of the smoke, you know, cherry tobacco, 79, and everything. And then she says to me, you have to choose, me or the pipe? I just met her. I said, the pipe. So she said, she said to me, oh yeah? She broke the pipe. <laughs> you don't mess with my wife, let me tell you. So anyway, so in 1988, I was active in the Likud party, and when we approached the elections, and I realized there was a very real chance I would not get a job after the elections, and I needed a job because we lost our business, we lost our home, we lost everything. And uh, so I asked one of the key people there, uh, could I have a job in the Likud? They said, no, we'd never give you a job. I said, why? I said, they said to me, because you are a spy from the David Levy camp. Does anyone know who David Levy is? Oh, you see, you guys are young, and you live here in America. In Israel, in 88, there were three camps in the Likud. You had Shamir, Sharon, and David Levy. David Levy was from Morocco, and he was like a, you know, one of these roughnecks, uh, he was very powerful. And my boss was his number two, uh, Dr. Eliyahu ben Elisar. And I said to the guy who was in charge, I said, listen, I'm a Beitari. I belong to the Beitar youth movement. It's you know, with us, it's uh, ideology, and uh, not this camp or that camp. He said, Avi, 
I remember you from the 60s. Okay, this is 1988, he remembers me from 68. He said, there is no more Beitar, there is no more ideology. Now you scratch my back, I scratch your back. You know what that means? It means corruption. There's no more ideology, it's just you do for me, I do for you. This has been the, the bane of Israeli politics for the last 40 years. So I decided in 1988, I have no future in the Likud. It had nothing to do with Netanyahu. You know, it's the way the, the politics was in Israel at that time and still today. Then I went to seminary for three years to be a rabbi, conservative rabbi. Then they threw me out because I opposed homosexual ordination and I was pro-life. I'm a terrible guy. I was on TV just a few months ago in the last election. They said, oh, so you're anti-LGBT. You're going to throw these homos off the rooftops like in Iran. I said, no, we're a conservative party. We believe in democracy, but our viewpoint is the Bible. But you guys represent Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that on TV. I'm crazy. I, I do crazy stuff. But I want you to know I enjoy what I do. And, and, and a, lot of people, a lot of people agree with it because it's in God's name. Okay, so <clears throat> Netanyahu, I want you to know, I love Benjamin Netanyahu. He is the greatest and longest lasting prime minister we ever had. And he brought Israel into the modern world. Israel was kind of like in many ways a Soviet socialist state mixed in with the Middle East, a third world country. I've been in Israel 53 years. And uh, Netanyahu made Israel a power. Israel is a power, military power, scientific power, economic power. Um, when I came to Israel, there were three million Jews. In 1999, there were five million. Today, there are seven million. I mean, our population is growing where many other countries, the populations are shrinking. And interestingly, because of the immigration of Christians from Russia, the former Soviet Union, Ethiopia, and other places, the Christian believers in Israel today are about half a million. Half a million means that in the Knesset, there should be eight to 10 members of Knesset out of 120 who are Christian believers. How many Christians are there in the Knesset? There's not one. You got 13 Muslims, you got five Druze, you all heard of the Druze, they're, they're another group of people. No Christians. And God, I felt, was kicking me you know where and saying the Christians have to have representation. How many people remember from school here in America, no taxation without representation? These Christians in Israel serve in the army, pay taxes, vote, and they're married to us or related to us by blood. And we hate them. Isn't it wonderful? pure Jewish state. I moved to Israel because it was a pure Jewish state and I was free to hate the Christians. Because that's what I was taught in Hebrew school. Do you know that my granddaughters come home from school and they say to me, you know what our teachers taught us in the Orthodox Jewish school in, in, where they live in Ofra? That all Christians are bad. They're teaching that today in the schools. The ultra-Orthodox and the more extreme modern orthodox. These people are promoting the idea that Christians are bad. They don't like the born-agains who come to Israel to stand with us. The evangelicals, they hate the messianics. And they don't think Christians should have representation in our government. Muslims, yes. And the rabbis teach, if you want to sell your apartment, don't sell it to a, a Christian, sell it to a Muslim. You know why? Because in Spain, in 1492, the Muslims were the allies of the Jews. People don't understand that there's been a metamorphosis of the Christians, and today, okay, 95% of the Christians don't like the Jews. Only 5%, that's 100 million. I'm very happy to have 100 million Christians with me. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So. My son and I had to work very hard to straighten out our grandkids. And Aaron should have been here in this church, maybe next time in October, November. 
But they were here in Orlando, and they were also in uh, Dallas a lot and in Los Angeles. And my grandkids get to know the Christians and fall in love with them. Do you remember? Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. What's anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism is when non-Jews hate the Jews and when Jews hate the non-Jews. You know what drives me crazy in Israel? We talk about the never again. Remember the Holocaust? They have all these Holocaust museums. Never again. And we have a new Holocaust facing us right in the face. And Jews don't want to see it. And if I talk bad about Islam, oh, he's a racist. Or Avi is a hate speech. So I got three years in jail in Switzerland. But instead of three years in jail, it was commuted to 10 years uh, probation. I'll tell you one thing, I'm not going skiing in Switzerland. <laughs> the Muslims follow me around everywhere. So they've got a plan to wipe us all off the face of the earth. Ask the Muslims, they will tell you, yes, Allah has commanded us at the right time to kill the Jews. Okay, so now I want to, how much time do I have? Because I need about maybe 15 minutes. Still have two hours. Okay. You know, Baptists give me 20 minutes. <laughs> Pentecostals give me an hour and a half. I need three hours, so. So I have to tell you, I'm driving. You know, in the winters, I suffer for Christ in Florida and Texas. That's funny. I don't know why nobody laughs here. I suffer for Christ. Here. And in the summer, I suffer for Christ in Canada. Okay, so. I'm driving up Interstate 5 in California, Oregon, Washington. I got churches all along the route. And then I have this brand new ch church. It's not a church, it's a farmhouse. 50 people in Maple Ridge. Has anyone been in Maple Ridge? Maple Ridge is a neighborhood just outside of Vancouver. And 50 RCMP <laughs> come to hear me. This is summer of 1999. This is two years before 9-11. You know, I have news for you. We are now two years before 9-11, number two. And do you know what the Muslims, my wife picked this up in her work. She listens to them. And they said to, to on their broadcasts, the next 9-11 will make the previous 9-11 pale in comparison. You know, Americans get a little cocky. America's saying, oh, we're so strong. You know, we've got helicopters and planes and rockets. And these Muslims are infiltrating this country by immigration. And there are 30 million of them. I'm going to show you in a few minutes how they get to 100 million. Right, we'll get to that. You believe that Muslims could be 100 million here? OK. Look at Ezekiel 29 after you go home. I'm going to share a little bit about Ezekiel 29. <clears throat> so I crossed the border. I speak Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. And I have to tell you, I was supposed to speak in a number of towns on the way to Edmonton, Canada. Messianic groups. And uh, the Messianic groups, you know, Messianic groups, I love them, but they're a little silly sometimes. Because what do they do? They invite the Jews to come. And then the Jews say, don't have Avi Lipkin, he's a racist. You know, he's a hate speech guy. And they canceled the meeting. So I spoke three nights, three hours each night in Vancouver, Maple Ridge. Finally, I made it up to Edmonton, Canada. And uh, I spoke in a Northern Baptist church. I have to tell them the joke. You know the difference between Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists? Northern Baptists go to hell. They, they didn't laugh in Canada when I told that joke. And I said, oh, come on. I said, that's a Texas joke. Anyway, Friday, Friday morning, my hostess, my Christian hostess, calls up the local Orthodox rabbi and says, here we have Avi Lipkin. He's an army spokesman from Israel. And he speaks in Christian churches to build support for Israel. So the rabbi says, okay, send him over for Shabbat. I go to the rabbi's house. And the first thing he says to me, what's a nice Jewish boy like you doing in the churches? Because, because no, in the Talmud, in the Talmud, it says it is forbidden to go into a house of pagan worship. When the Talmud was written in the year 500, all the churches had idols and icons and all these things which were considered pagan. Not like the Protestant churches today. And um, I said to him, listen, we're 5 million Jews at that time. 
Um, Muslims are one and a half billion. And we're five million. They want to wipe us off the face of the earth. But if we had a hundred million born agains with us, that might level the playing field. And the rabbi said, wow, that's wonderful. God bless you. Good that you go to the churches. I mean, I wouldn't step in the church, but if you go to the churches, God bless you. That's what the rabbi said to me. Because it says in the Talmud, don't go into the churches. It also says in the Talmud, don't read the New Testament. It doesn't say don't read the New Testament. It says anyone who reads the pseudo epigraphy does not go to heaven. Pseudo-epigraphy is the uh, external writings. I studied that in seminary. I loved it. You know, it's all Jewish writings. New Testament, Jewish writings. So I'm going to hell with you guys. It's okay. In a handbasket. <laughs> and listen, we got crazies on our side too. So the next morning, the rabbi introduces me in the Saturday Orthodox synagogue. He says, here we have Avi Lipkin. The Christians give him 10 hours to speak, because I had just spoken 10 hours in Vancouver, and we're going to give him 10 minutes <laughs> after, after the service. So I've got to tell you something. Has anyone here ever gone to an Orthodox uh, synagogue for the service? So I have to tell you, I, I went to study to be a rabbi, conservative, but conservative uh, Jewish people pray the same way as the Orthodox. We just have ta we've taken out the animal sacrifices, and men and women sit together. Like, I can't understand, I wish I had a daughter, but if I had a daughter, why wouldn't she sit with me in the synagogue? So I think that women should dress modestly, but if you have a problem praying to God because there's a woman in the room, you need a psychiatrist. <laughs> and uh, by the way, the Muslims, Muslims, same thing. Okay. So I'm telling you a little story from Dallas. But all the synagogues are like this. You go to synagogue, starts at, say, 9 o'clock. In Israel, 8 o'clock, but in, 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 in America, 9 o'clock. And you start the service with 10 men. You cannot start before you have 10 men. 10 men is a quorum. We say in Hebrew, minyan. And uh, we have these preliminary prayers, warm up, and uh, get 10, 20 guys. Then after 45 minutes, we take out the Torah. That's for like an hour. And by then, if there's a bar mitzvah, we have 30, 40 more people coming in. If not, then we have maybe 10, 20 coming in. So we're up to 40, 50 altogether. Then they have the rabbi's sermon. Now, many of our rabbis are like valedictorians. You want to hear what they have to say. They are, they, you know, we have a joke about the rabbis. A rabbi is only as good as his last sermon. Maybe that applies to pastors also, I don't know. But, but then we have the musaf. Musaf is the final service and the second part of the service. And towards the end of the service, it's about 70, 80 people. And then when the service is over, we have the meal. Then there are 300 people there. <laughs> and Do does anyone, huh? That sounds like that. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever hear of JFK? Well, you know what JFK stands for? It stands for just for Kiddush. People come just for the Kiddush, for the meal. And you know, we Jews are very special. Contrary to the Baptists, we drink booze. And on Shabbat, we drink a lot of booze. Especially Chabad. They, they drink, and we don't drive, so there's no problem. You know, we kind of go walking <laughs> home like this. <laughs> and I drink more booze than anyone else. And everyone gets drunk a little bit. Not to exaggerate it, but everyone's slapping each other on the back, and everyone's laughing and telling jokes. Jewish people work very hard the whole week. Shabbat is the day of the socializing. Everyone's together, and it's wonderful. It's like a country club, it's like a party. I'm very happy to be a Jew. But then I think to myself of what I've been hearing about what's about to happen to the Jews in America, and the rabbis, you know, they, they screen me first before I go into the synagogue. They know who I am. They know that I'm the father of Aaron. Aaron is like a, a lovey-dovey teddy bear. When you meet my son, you'll understand. Aaron never offends anyone. I offend everyone. <laughs> and so the rabbi said, none of this shenanigans with Islam and politics, and you know, this is synagogue, we're praying to God, and we're having family time, and you behave. And they, but they let me in, you know. So after the, after the rabbi introduced me, 
He said, I'll be going to talk 10 minutes at the meal after the service. So I get up to speak, and uh, all of a sudden, two liberals start shouting me down. See, liberals are liberal with you if you are liberal like they are. But if you are not liberal like they are, they're not going to be very liberal with you. And these guys shouted me down, and they wouldn't let me speak. I didn't speak. The rabbi wanted me to get up to speak. They wouldn't let me speak. So a Christian lady, a Christian lady, going to the Orthodox synagogue every Shabbat, because guess who went to synagogue on Shabbat? Jesus Christ. Okay? So if Jesus goes to synagogue, what does he do? What does it say in the New Testament? He reads from the Torah, he reads from the prophets, and then he delivers a sermon. This is exactly the way it is today. And Jesus was a rabbi, so he had a certain standing. And I want you to know, the Jews did not kill Jesus Christ. The, ra the rabbis and the Romans killed him. They killed him because the people loved him so much. Okay. So the Christian lady gets up, and she says, you all, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you all know me. I've been coming to the synagogue every Shabbat for many months. She was considering converting. I don't know if she converted or not, or if she was just messianic. And she said, I am a social worker for the government of Canada, the province of Alberta, and the city of Edmonton. And I am a caseworker for a Muslim woman doctor from Egypt. And this woman from Egypt was kind of like Mother Teresa. She worked in the poorest neighborhood of Cairo. She fed the, 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 the hungry. She healed the sick. She was in her 40s. She wasn't married. And so she decided, midlife crisis, I'm going to move to Canada. She applies for a visa. The Canadians snap her up because this woman is famous in a good way. And this woman was a good Muslim. She went to the mosque every day. She prayed five times a day. She gave zakat. Zakat is charity. And when the visa was approved, the next day there was a knock on her door. And it was three jihadis from the mosque. And they knew her. And they said to her in Arabic, Mabruk. Mabruk means congratulations. So she answered them, Allah barak fiq. You should also have congratulations. Why do I have congratulations? Because we know you're going to Canada. And we also have congratulations. Because you're going to work for us. And she said, what does that mean? Oh, yes, you're going to have a clinic, a very successful clinic in Edmonton. And uh, the Jews of Edmonton, Canada, will come to your clinic. The Christians will come to your clinic. And the Muslims will come to your clinic. And you're going to collect all their vital information on the hard disk and give it to us. And when a war, you listening, when a war breaks out in the Middle East, we are preparing for a war here in Canada and in the U.S. and in Mexico and all the Western countries. The Muslims of Edmonton are responsible for killing the Jews of Edmonton and their Christian spouses. You know, we hate the Christians till we marry them. That's supposed to be funny. Do you know that there are 6 million Jews in America married to 4 million Christians? Where do you think they're going to go when the Muslims come to kill the Jews? The Muslims are going to come to kill the Christians also. Everyone has to go to Israel. Anyway. So she said, listen, I'm a doctor. I swore the Hippocratic Oath to heal people and save lives. I don't understand politics. I'm not interested in politics. And I'm definitely not into killing anyone, even the Jews. See, she was a Muslim, but she was a good person, a saint. So standing next to this Muslim woman doctor was another Muslim woman helping her in the clinic many years. And the three jihadis grabbed her, pulled out a knife, and they slit her throat. And they said to the doctor, if you don't work for us, this is what we're going to do to you. The next day, she had political asylum uh, in the Canadian embassy. The Canadian Air Force flew in a private jet to Cairo to pick her up and bring her to Edmonton. And then this Christian woman in the synagogue was the caseworker for this Muslim woman doctor. You see, God had me drive all the way across the Rockies of Canada 20 hours to Edmonton to shut up and listen to this woman. This is the second most important uh, testimony of all my testimonies. And she went on to say that she works very closely with the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. 
and they said to her that 90% of the Muslims in Canada are peacekeeping, law-abiding citizens. Only 10% are terrorists. And I think I told you, in my estimation, there are 30 million Muslims in the United States. If only 10% are terrorists, how much is 10% of 30 million? 3 million. And they all have guns. And the Jews don't have guns. And the terrorists have a head start. And the bottom line is to kill the Jews. And if the Jews are married to the Christians, the Christian spouses too, like Hitler. And those who were out of the wedlock of the Christian and the Jew. Do you understand why I'm going to be prime minister? Because all these people are going to come to Israel. Or they stay here and die. And I can't talk about this in the synagogues because the rabbis don't want to lose their flocks. The synagogues will shut down because the Jews are going to go home to Israel. You know, we Jews, we pray three times a day for God to gather up all the exiles and bring them home. Do you see them going to Israel? Do you see them leaving the country club? Okay. I have to tell you another thing. I was in a Southern Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, and uh, after I spoke, four policemen came up to me, and they said, we have to tell you a little story. Four policemen. They said, our friend, the sheriff in Tulsa, which is an hour and a half away, was responding to an alarm that went off in a mosque in Tulsa. Went downstairs to check it out, check out the premises. Door was open in one of the rooms, and he found dozens of machine guns hanging on the wall. Immediately called the FBI, and the FBI said, you can't touch them. It's all legal. They have licenses. The Muslims are following very carefully the American laws to have weapons. And the New York Times says, why do the Muslims have weapons? Because they, are, they feel bad that the Americans hate them. Have you ever heard such a crazy cockamamie thing from the New York Times? So I don't want to go too long. I want to share something that happened to me last summer. I had dinner, lunch, dinner, was in the afternoon with a neo-Nazi. Now, I didn't know he was a neo-Nazi. I knew he was a conservative. And we sat down, we sat down for about two hours. We had a very, very wonderful lunch. And he said to me, Avi, you are a very special Jew. Why? Because you are conservative, you are pro-Republican, you're pro-Trump, and you're pro-America. You are pro-patriotism for America. And uh, you're really one of us. And also he said to me, you know, because the Jews voted 70% for Biden. You know, the Jews are Democrats. And he said to me, you know, the Jews are all socialists and communists and they're all traitors. You know, I said, I know that the Jews have a problem, but that's because the Jewish people are universalists. Jewish people are not patriots in any country. They are universalists for all of humanity. So they're hated because they're not pro-Christian patriots. Then he said to me, what do you think about the uh, defund the police. I said, well, that's terrible. It's obvious it's terrible because there's going to be crime and there's going to be killing and you have to have police. He said, no, he said, you don't understand. Defund the police is fantastic because after the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, rest in peace, um, our militias grew from 3 million to 30 million in America. And the first thing we're going to do is kill the Jews. So not only do you have, not only do you have the 30 million Muslims, 10% of which are going to kill the Jews, you have 30 million militia, 10% of which are going to kill the Jews. That's already 6 million armed people. And that's without the Antifa, and that's without the Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter originated after, out of Islam, uh, Islamic Jihad, here in Florida. Uh, so, the writing is on the wall. Uh, Jews' time in America is very short. Perhaps Christian time in America is very short. Uh, whatever happens to the Jews happens to the Christians and vice versa. I wanted to throw in a little bit of Bible prophecy. How many people know Ezekiel th uh, 29? 
Ezekiel 29 talks about a strange scenario. Egypt will become a desolation. And no human will tread in Egypt for 40 years. No animal will tread in Egypt for 40 years. And this will be from Aswan on the border with Sudan all the way down to Migdol on the Mediterranean. And it doesn't say that the Egyptians die. It says the Egyptians will be scattered to all the nations in the world, four corners of the earth. And that the Egyptians will be returned to Egypt after 40 years of exile. And I have to tell you, I got court-martialed in the Israeli army many times. You see, I'm a troublemaker. So one of the reasons I got court-martialed was because there's this Christian guy, you might have heard of him, Stan Goodenough. Yeah, he's fantastic. I got court-martialed because of him. I got vindicated, but I got court-martialed. He wrote in 1995 an article in his monthly or whatever it was that the Egyptian minister of war, who Whitey said war with Israel is a certainty and Egypt is ready. Listen, you got generals, they live for war. They, it's like Pat, General Patton. General Patton wanted war all the time. Whitey wanted a war with Israel. Praise God, there was no war. Then another minister of war, Tantawi, said, this, this is why I got court-martialed. Even though Israel has nuclear weapons, we will know how to cut off the arm of the enemy when the time comes. So the Israeli army got upset that Avi Lipkin is talking about nuclear weapons, which I should not have been doing. I said, I wasn't talking about nuclear weapons. I was just quoting Stan Goodenough, who was quoting this uh, minister of war, Tantawi. So the fear is, people are saying Israel, perhaps if Israel has nuclear weapons, which we don't know, you know. Maybe if there was a war with Egypt, Israel might do something to the Aswan Dam. I mean, a nuclear blast at the Aswan Dam, Egypt gets flooded by Lake Nasser. But it's not Israel that's going to do it. Who said they were going to do it? Iran. Because in the war in Syria, the Sunnis against the Shiites, the Sunnis lost, and the Egyptians wanted to send the Egyptian army into Syria to back up the Sunnis. And Russia sent troops in to back up the Shiites. And so Iran said, uh, Iran is Shiite, to Egypt, if you send one soldier to Syria, we're going to blow up the Aswan Dam. And personally, if you ask me, I think the Iranians already have nuclear weapons. I, you know, I didn't see the movie The Perfect Storm. I mean, that's about weather. I'm talking about perfect storm of anti-Semitism. Ignorance is bliss, and America is absolutely the happiest country on earth. So, my number one aim is that people like you should all be coming to Israel, standing with us. My number two aim is that we should be welcoming you, that you will be part of us. And when 10 million Jews and Christians have to flee this country to embrace all of you and bring us into the fold, and if ISIS conquers Saudi Arabia, which it will, and Jordan, which it will, and Syria, which it will, and Lebanon, which it will, and there will be black flags up along the Israeli border, black flags of ISIS. And they will be digging tunnels under the border. You know, they are doing that already with Gaza and Hezbollah. You think Israel can just sit back and say, have a good day? So Israel's borders, I believe, are going to expand. Our population is going to grow. We're going to turn the desert into a Garden of Eden. You know, I'll say one last thing, which is not really seemingly important. It doesn't really have anything to do with the message. But it does, in a way. You know, when I moved to Israel in 68, it's good that I'm old, you know, that I have this experience. Jerusalem Post, our English language newspaper, gave a report that in Amman, Jordan, which you can see from my house in Kedar, they had water in their taps in 1968. They had water in their taps for two days out of the week. Five days out of the week, the Jordanians had no water. Fast forward, 
Pres Prime Minister Rabin makes peace with Jordan in 1994. And part of the peace agreement is we're going to give Jordan all the water they need. Now also, one of the things we noticed is that the precipitation is unpredictable. The rain is unpredictable. And our population grew from 648,000 to 10 million with the same water. So we knew that Israel had to develop desalination plants. Today, the Jewish people, the Arabs, the Christians, everyone drinks desalinated water, 70%. Jordan, for the peace agreement, now has water 24-7, thanks to Israel. You bless the Jews, you bless Israel, God is going to bless you. Literally, we have the Jordanians over a barrel, the barrel of water. If they want to fool around with us, they're not going to get no water. Can a nation live without no water? What's happening in Iran right now? The Iranians turn on the tap and mud comes out. The Iranians may not be starving, but they are thirsting. God Almighty, if these people would love Israel, Israel would build desalination plants all along the coast. The, the Iranians would have all the water they needed. But they have to insist on hating the Jews, anti-Semitism. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. That's why what Lori and Stan are doing is so important. Of course, Pastor Diaz, I'm so honored to be here tonight. And the good news is that we all know the end. We all know who wins. Strap yourselves into the roller coaster and enjoy the ride. Thank you very much.